Hello, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Anna Maria Perrick, and I'm a cytotechnologist. I'm actually now working for Hologic, who is the company that is bringing the thin prep pap test collection method to you in Saskatchewan. And I'm joined by Shannon. Hi, Shannon. Hello, everyone. My name is Shannon. I am also a cytotechnologist and I'm very excited to be working with the Saskatchewan physicians to bring the thin prep pap test to you. As I mentioned earlier, this is a Saskatchewan wide or provincial wide change. And this is a memo that came out from the SHA stating the change that we are making from conventional to liquid based PAP testing using the thin prep PAP test. The reason for the in service today is we have a few uh, minor changes we wanted to share with everyone. So the physician collection kit is going to change. We're going to have an AR spatula, which is going to be plastic. We're going to have an endocervical brush, which is going to be the same as what you're currently using. And we're going to switch out the glass slide, mailer, and spray fixative for the vial. So the reason for the AR spatula change is the wooden spatulas you're currently using are porous. And the media that you're going to be rinsing in is a liquid media. When you go to rinse the wooden spatula within that liquid media, the wood would absorb the liquid and pull the cells and it fixed the cells to the spatula, not releasing them back into the uh, media. So we're switching that one out. Your endocervical brush stays the same. And as I just mentioned, we're moving away from the slide, the mailer and the spray fixative into a liquid vial, which will give the cells immediate fixation and have a stability of six weeks. We also wanted to take this opportunity just to remind you all of what the ideal conditions are for taking a pap test. The first is no intercourse for 48 hours before, no vaginal medications, personal lubricants, or douching for 48 hours before the exam. And this is even more important now as we are moving to a more sensitive and specific test where the cells that we need to see are more readily visualized. Changes in uh, morphology can occur due to using uh, vaginal medications, personal lubricants, and the other things I mentioned. I also wanna clarify when I mean by vaginal medications is we don't want them to be using any over-the-counter medications. So for example, if someone is using medications to medicate for a uh, candida infection, that is what we are referring to, not any medications that are being prescribed by yourself or another physician. The other thing I'd like to mention is when we would like you to take the PAP during the menstrual cycle. I'm sure we all know that two weeks after the first day of the last menstrual period is the ideal time for taking the PAP. We just want to make sure that the PAP is not being taken during active menstruation, so days one to five. Any days outside of that should be fine. Now that the instructions are reference um, refreshers on what the patient needs to do, let's give a refresher on what we need to do in order to get an adequate sample. So we need to prepare the cervix. This is not a, a thin prep specific um, technique. This is just general pap collection technique where we want to prep the cervix. We want to remove that excess uh, discharge and mucin from the face of the cervix. Because if we do not do that and you go and collect that ecto cervix sample, that's all we're gonna collect, and that's typically acellular, and that will give your patient an unsatisfactory result. So we would like to have the cervix face prepped, and this is simply by putting a two by two gauze on the face of the cervix, and then removing it with a ring forceps um, to pull off that excess mucin or any discharge. The other option is to utilize a swab in order to touch the face of the cervix, doing a 360 rotation, and also moving that excess mucus plug in any sort of discharge. And just a quick note on the speculum insertion, we would really prefer that warm water be used, and that is generally more than sufficient for most patients. Warm water is more than sufficient um, according to many of the clinicians that we have seen. However, there are certain patients that will require a little bit of lubricant, and for that reason, we have tested all of the lubricants on the market to see which ones are compatible with the methanol-based preservative that you'll be putting the sample into. Of all of the um, lubricants on the market, three of them did not clump up and coagulate when we placed it into the methanol-based preservative. The one that is readily available to you in Saskatchewan is the Surgi Lube Surgical Lubricant. 
And if you are going to be using this lubricant on a patient, please use it sparingly. So a dime-sized amount should be applied to the middle of the speculum and avoid the tip. The reason that we're talking about lubricant is as we are moving to a more sensitive and specific test, other things, other interfering substances can unfortunately cause um, the, the results to be a little bit skewed. So we also want to make sure that we're preparing you for the future, meaning ancillary testing and possible HPV testing that might come sometime later can also have um, interferences or interfering substances that might make the very sensitive ancillary testing or molecular tests um, give a neg or a inadequate result. So for that reason, we are really emphasizing the use of warm water as opposed to lubricant, and if absolutely necessary, the Surgi Lube lubricant, which you can order from one of these um, four, uh, four um, providers here. So we have Sean, which is the one that is the most readily used, and then we have all of these different um, ways that you can actually purchase it. So there is the metal tube, and then there is the one-time use Foley packs. So now we've reviewed prepping the cervix and the use of lubricants. Uh, the collection piece is the last piece, and that really hasn't changed. We are still going to collect the ectocervix with the AR spatula. So this is a 360 rotation around the face of the cervix, removing it and rinsing it vigorously in the vial. At this time, you can choose to leave the spatula within the vial. I'll tell you why you may want to do that in a moment, or you will discard it. Next, you're going to go in with the endocervical brush, and this is going to collect the transition zone. So we want to insert the brush, observing the most bottom bristles, and then we're going to do a quarter to a half inch turn in one direction. We do not want to over rotate. Over rotation does not collect any more cellular material. What it does do is creates bleeding and discomfort for the patient. So once you do your quarter to a half inch turn in one direction, you're going to remove that brush and you're also going to rinse this vigorously within the vial. From some of our previous uh, webinars, the clinicians had mentioned that brush tends to like to hang on to the material, even on when they're trying to smear it on the conventional slide. So based on the function of that brush, that's totally true. What we wanna do is help you remove the excess material if you can't get it off from rinsing in the vial. And that's when I had said you could leave that spatula within the vial. Utilizing the spatula, you could uh, use it to rub up and down against the bristles of the brush in the vial, releasing any excess material. Once you've done that, give the two collection devices one last swish, and then you can discard it. The last thing I want to point out then is now recapping that vial. Once you get your supplies in the clinic, you'll notice that there is a black mark on the cap and a black mark on the vial. We call these torque lines. What we want to have the lab do, or what we want the clinics to do, is ensure that the black torque lines, when you reseal the cap, are either meeting or they are passing each other so that it prevents leakage when the sample is getting transported to the laboratory. And as we're all visual learners, Anna Maria and I thought there'd be a little video that would clarify what I just described in the pictogram. So you're going to start with the spatula that looks just like the one that you've been using. However, it's plastic now, and you're going to sample the ectocervix with a 360 turn full rotation. This is just a top view and a side view of what that collection looks like. And once you've got that sample, you're going to take your spatula and swirl it vigorously into the vial to try and get all of that material off and inside of the liquid. Next, you'll go in with the brush. It looks like this. And you're going to insert that into the endocervix until just the bottom most fibers are exposed. Just a quarter to a half a turn in one direction is more than sufficient as over rotation can cause bleeding and some discomfort for the patient. It also doesn't get us any higher of a cellular yield. So just a quarter to a half a turn in one direction is more than enough. 
Once you've got that sample, you can swirl the brush in the vial and get the vial and just kind of push it against the wall and use the spatula if you need to, to try and help you get all of that material off and into the liquid. That concludes the short in-service today. Um, we have a few questions that have come up from previous webinars that I thought I'd share with those of you out there. Um, it has to do with the stability of the vial. So first off, I mentioned the vial is going to come in a flat of 25 um, with matching collection devices. Each vial is safety sealed, so we would like you to remove the safety seal from each vial prior to utilizing it. Um, it will um, help when you go to reseal it and the vial, that plastic wrap, we don't want to have that caught into our instrumentation when it gets received within the lab. Next. The other question that has come up is the stability of the cells within the vial. And I mentioned this early on in the presentation that uh, once the sample has been collected, it is stable for six weeks in the vial, which is helpful for those of you sending from out of the city limits. There was a question about the stability of the vial um, with temperature. So there is no special temperature um, requirements. The vials are stable at room temperature. So there is no special storage that is required. And the last question that sort of came up was on, uh, is that vial sensitive to light? And the answer is no to that as well. So again, no special storage requirements for the vials. What you see on the screen right now are the laboratory contacts. This was on the back of that memo that Anna Maria showed at the beginning of the presentation. If you have any further questions or concerns, please do not hesitate to reach out to the lab and they will either contact Anna Maria and myself, or they'll be able to answer the questions for you as well. Thank you for your time today. We hope you found this helpful. Thank you so much. Take care.